Space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the last standee. It's a continuing mission to explore strange new genres, to seek out new games and new mechanics, to boldly roll where no one has rolled before. I'm First Officer Fenn, and here on the bridge of the last standee, I am joined by Admiral Alexis. Coming from the Space Federation of Belgium, Admiral Alexis. And Commander Kara. My head headphones aren't working. <laughs> oh no! Uh, we, we've already got technical difficulties. We've lost, we've lost Commander Car to the void. C comms are down, quick. Check it out. Well, it's okay. <laughs> we heard her. Uh, today we'll navigate our way to the battle before slingshotting through Azaya, Legends of a Drift system, and finally getting into a pitched battle with Star Wars X Wing The Miniatures game. But before that, we'll check in with our officers and see how they're doing. So, report in, Admiral. <laughs> well, uh, in the past uh, couple of weeks, the one thing that to talk about for uh, a couple of minutes here quickly is uh, I'm pretty sure that everybody that plays uh, tabletop games uh, because of COVID and because of usually uh, finding people is uh, hard sometimes has used Roll20 in the past. Uh, I have used Roll20 for years and years, and I've always thought Roll20 for years and years, and I've always thought that it was uh, kind of a crappy service, but the best that there was. Well, recently I've discovered uh, Foundry Virtual Tabletop, and uh, it's been a pretty amazing experience. I, I, the, the only problem is that there's no really any good uh, demo version, so you can... I, the, the only problem is that there's no really any good uh, demo version, so you kind of have to just uh, take the plunge for 40 euros, which is kind of expensive, but it is so much better than Roll20. Um, I've had to play both games through distance for the, the since the start of the pandemic, and uh, Foundry just uh, changed everything. It's so much better. It has a very strong community that has done a ton of modules and a fan-made uh, modification to allow people to uh, bring in their own system for every uh, different types of uh, tabletop games. And it's just so, yeah, uh, I would recommend anybody that like uh, tabletop games to just check out Foundry Virtual Tabletop and they probably have a module for the whichever game system that you like. And it's probably uh, a lot better than anything else on the market. Uh, even the official, uh, even the official D and D stuff uh, does not compare to the to Foundry. Uh, I would really recommend it. Mm, uh, yeah, I use Foundry for uh, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, uh, and it's been it's been good. It hasn't been perfect. Um, there's been a good. It hasn't been perfect. Um, there's been a few clashes in modules and difficulty mm. setting up the server and things, but it has been it's it's got some impressive stuff in it. Uh, I'd also like to briefly um, also say Fantasy Grounds has been really good. Um, it's less flashy than uh, Grounds has been really good. Um, it's less flashy than uh, than I want to say Forge because I run Foundry via the Forge service. <laughs> so Foundry, um, it's been better for my personal um, use when we're playing Call of Cthulhu. Um, we're, because we're still playing Complete Masks. Because we're still playing Complete Masks. We're about to take a break on Warhammer at the end of Death on the Reich, um, just before my favourite story happens in that campaign. And we're going to move to Egypt in the Complete Masks. So, oh, interesting. Yeah, um, I, I can also say uh, Foundry has been very good. Yeah. I... Foundry has been very good yeah i i've played uh lancer with it which is um which has a lot of different system and like the different ways to calculate movement or uh, use certain items it's it's not too complicated but it can be a lot especially if you're using a third party uh system instead of the uh system instead of just playing on a table and foundry has modules that handle all of it and it's really good about it so uh yeah at least for Lancer, I can say it's amazing. Uh, and I've played a bit of a mock book with it, and it will also works really well. Uh, oh, well so, that's yeah. great. Uh, great. Communication channels and see if uh, if Commander Kara is now available. Yes, yes. Is this all, all problems with communication have been resolved. 
I, I had a look, and I think we took some damage from an asteroid that broke the uh, the communications array. But it, everything seems to be sorted now. <laughs> Chief uh, Chief Engineer Hamster got it cleared up. Yes. How have you been? Um, well, I'm fine. Um, I did get to play Everdell, uh, like on Friday, and uh, it was the first game night during the pandemic <laughs> I had. Um, it, it was really incredible because something happened that has never happened to me in any game before. You know, basically any game that decides winner with victory points has some kind of tiebreaker in it. Yeah? In case like of the five people that are playing, two have the same second tiebreaker being used. This time we were three players. We all had 57 points. So we went to the first tiebreaker, um, which is how many events everyone has. Uh, two of us had two events each. So we actually had to go to the third, actually a reason why you might need tiebreakers. Yeah, um, apart from that, I um, did get around to play a couple of uh, games solo, um, Atlantis Rising, um, what was it, Petricor and Winterhaven Wood Rising, um, what was it, Petricor and Winterhaven Woods, which made me realize that games do solo modes very differently and also the explanations in the rule books. Um, there are games that do it better and games. Um, there are games that do it better and games that do it worse. Like the worst thing is um, some explanation like, yeah, just, you know, follow the normal rules with these exceptions. And then you sit there and have to flip pages uh, back and forth uh, because thing is listed. Um, yeah. Yeah, sometimes a solo player's handbook, like specifically could be helpful. That's when you tend to go off the board game geek and be like, okay, can I have a reference sheet for solo play, please? Yeah, I mean, for for example, pet I mean, it's fine if it's like, okay, you know, follow all normal rules, except when it's set different here. But then it's like, okay, you know, do this action just like normally, but change this. So it's not like they write the code change this. So it's not like they write the code new action there, but just the part of it that has changed. So I have to read what has changed and I have to flip 10 pages back to where the action is described. And it's like a whole paragraph. So I have to read through it and then flip forward and it's like a whole paragraph. So I have to read through it and then flip forward again and look, okay, uh, and what has changed now exactly? Mm -hmm. That's, um, yeah. <laughs> I like I know the feeling I really do. Uh, even had the feeling with one of the games. Uh, well, two of the games we have solo modes, and one of them really I had to learn it solo, and it resulted in a lot of flipping back and forth between the main rules and the solo specific rules, and being like, oh. Well, <laughs> oh, I can imagine that it gets that very complicated solo. Um, I don't know if you know which one I'm talking about, but it might not be the one you're thinking of. We're going to talk about, very briefly, two spaced games. I wanted to fit into this. I didn't have the room, um, so I'm going to very briefly just say, hey, look out for these. I thoroughly recommend them. I've had immense fun playing both of them. Um, and they are The the Captain is Dead. Which is a which is a two to seven player cooperative game. Basically, the concept is: Hey, you're on like a, the end of a, an episode of of a space kind of series, and oh no, the captain's just been killed, and everything's gone to heck, and you and the crew have to manage the ship and make sure it doesn't get blown up by the invaders. To manage the ship and make sure it doesn't get blown up by the invaders, and just handle that. It's it's like a very bright, colourful, pandemic style of mechanics, but with a lot of emphasis on the thematic experience. So you can teleport stuff around, you can move all over the place. It's got an absurd number of move all over the place. It's got an absurd number of characters you can play as, uh, including everyone's personal favourite. You can just play the red shirts. 
as in your character is the only character in the game who can die uh, and they can take damage to protect other characters and then when they die a new red shirt comes into the picture and takes over the and takes over the job which is really fun it's got a nice sense of humor there's three different episodes there's the original captain is dead which is a spaceship under attack there's captain is dead lockdown where everyone's been caught and they're on a alien ship as prisoners and then there's Captain is Dead Dangerous Planet, Captain is Dead Dangerous Planet, which is quite a bit of a break from the other two. It's more of a tower defense style game. Um, I would just thoroughly recommend the first Captain is Dead. There's a, a app version of it on Steam. Um, I like the app version, but the sound effects are really obnoxious. Um, so Captain is Dead, brilliant. Captain is Dead, brilliant. And then the other one is a Kickstarter that arrived for me recently. It's probably hard to find. It's called Adele, um, which is an acronym. And in, in essence, it's a mission to Mars. And like 2001 AD, a space odyssey, the computer's gone rogue, plays as Adele. Everyone else plays as the crew. And the crew have two different missions they're trying to achieve. They're either looking to like, a, I think it's abandoned ship or blow up, uh, destroy Adele. Um, and the really interesting part of it is first of all they've given you a solo mode a cooperative mode is um okay uh there's an expansion where one player plays an alien force that's invading the ship instead of adele as the hostile but the thing i love and thought was really cool is this is a one versus many game where normally the hidden information all is in the hands of the single player um and this it's mostly face up but the hit rule that well adele is the ship adele's in the ship the players are not allowed to do any kind of secret whispering or quiet conversation or pass notes everything has to be talked about openly so adele can hear it um, except if two astronauts get into the same room they can share information and that's important because each mission and that's important because each astronaut has they know what two of the missions are one or two of the missions each so they can like get together and secretly show and say look here, this is what I'm. This is what I know we need to do, and this, and then the other person's like, "Great, well, we need to do this." And then you have these joyous conversations where the two, where the two players who are aware of each other's information are trying to talk about it without giving too much away. Because if Adele knows where you're trying to go, she can just shut you down. So you've got to be clever about it. That's it's quite claustrophobic. Really fun. Yeah. It is. It's 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 got double-sided boards. It's gorgeous. Um, double-sided boards it's gorgeous um i love the artwork and the kickstarter was one of those ones that just happened along in the background and suddenly i was like oh it's it's complete and it's arrived and it caught me off guard as it turned up and i was like wow this is this was a nice kickstarter experience so it's a dot it's a dot d dot e dot l dot e dot uh, it's from dmz games it's designed by albert reyes um, and illustrated by Jose Soto. And if you do see it around and you think, I like the sounds of 2001 Space Odyssey, the board game, 2001 Space Odyssey, the board game, with some a fairly substantial amount of options, although some of those might be just Kickstarter options. I don't know. Um, some of it was like, it, it seemed like it was Kickstarter bonus stuff. But uh, yeah, thumbs up. So I just wanted to quickly... Uh, yeah thumbs up so i just wanted to quickly mini review those two games because they're on theme and they both deserve more highlighting so with that out of the way let us set phases for stun as we travel to the aquatic land of fleet the dice game admiral tell us all about this king dice oh i thought that we were going to talk about star fleets um <coughs> well I, i'll i'll um reconvene a little bit and try to stay on to this uh, sci-fi topic to talk about um, a game about fishermen. Not not really in team, but uh, we'll, we'll see. Uh, hey, hey, it's all about fish and ships today. <laughs> so it, it is a very straightforward uh, dice rolling game about being a fisherman. Um, it's actually the dice version of a, of a card game that I like a lot. That's just called Fleet, and that is very fun. Um, 
kind of a fast paced uh, you can play it under 30 minutes with friends paced uh, you can play it under 30 minutes with friends uh, the dice game kind of keeps the same um, ideal i think that with um with three players the longest that i had was a 45 minutes game um as soon as you you know the rules it's pretty quick it's pretty fun um as soon as you you know the rules it's pretty quick it's pretty fun um it's very straightforward the idea is that you are going to roll the dice on your on the start of your turn to determine which um type of fish you're going to invest in uh they can be different uh you can go for a a ship that will that will help you catch uh, cod, another for swordfish, uh, and each one of those is going to give you a few bonuses, uh, as well as uh, award you fishing uh, ships. And then you do a second phase that's going to give you some income depending on what you have. If you are doing for if you are going, for. Um, then one turn out of two you're going to have a fishing phase that will, will just fill your boat slowly. And then uh, you're going to have an arbor phase in which you're going to roll dice and everybody's going to pick one uh, action to do at the, in the arbor that's going to give you some different in the arbor that's going to give you some different bonus or different ways to get uh, victory points. Um, and again, just goes on like this. It doesn't do anything unique, I want to say. But everything that it does, it does it extremely well. Uh, there's lots of choice and uh, extremely well. Uh, there's lots of choice and uh, different tactics that you, that you can go with the game. At all points, it always feels like you can do something and you can go towards something. And it's very rare that you have a turn and you feel like, oh, this turn is just wasted. Uh, there's this thing, but because every player... Um, pick a die out of the, the die pool. It's kind of a kind of like a draft. Um, it never feels too restricted. And if you can't go for, uh, if none of the die interests you, you can always decide to default to just gaining, uh, gaining one coin, which is it's a very fun game because it never feels like you're locked into something. Um, in the three games that I've played, I've played solo, I've played with one person, I've played with three people. Um, the game has been um, fairly quick and the score at the end have been uh, very close to one another. Uh, There's also a solo mode and I think that... Oh, I should have looked that up. Uh, I think that it was in the top 30 uh, best solo game of uh, BGG in 2021, I want to say. Um, I'll, I'll look up the, the correct um, place and I'll update it into the, the podcast. <laughs> Uh, it's just really fun to play to play solo uh, or with people, uh, and I think that Fen played it for a fair bit too. So yeah, uh, I was gonna get to yeah. chip in a bit with some some of the features I really like. So first of all, let's start with the solo mode. It's interesting because the AI instead of competing against you for you for a score, it locks down sections of the um, of the scoring pads from the bottom upwards by selecting dice. So you'll roll the same as a two player game so you'll in the fishing phase you'll get three dice and on even turns i believe you go first i can't remember the, it swaps around on you go first i can't remember the, it swaps around on odds and even turns but anyway um you'll pick one and then the ai will pick one and then you both get an effect on the last dice so you're looking at it and and, and the ai will rotate through the different um like catch types to uh, which a shrimp, cod, lobster, uh, which a shrimp, cod, lobster, swordfish, and oyster, um, gradually. So you you get an idea of what the AI is going to be aiming for, and you can be like, oh, that's really important. I don't want them taking the bottom section of the cod off because that's my strategy. So I better take the cod dice away, even though maybe I would prefer to have shrimp. Um, so that was really cool. Um, so that was really cool. I also like how each fish type has a different focus to change your strategy. So shrimps give you wild dice. So the, the shrimp becomes any face you like. And then it starts to become any face plus a bonus star. And at the highest level, you get that face twice. You get that face twice and a bonus star. And it's, it's really powerful. But then the cod gives you money for launching boats. And 
as you gain money, you'll hit these star points. And they're, they're, they're really cool. They give you that gambling kick of, hey, I get a bonus. And you can just color in anything else straight away. And that might trigger another bonus. in anything else straight away. And that might trigger another bonus. And off you go. Yeah, g getting getting good income at the start doesn't feel like much. But sometimes you can get two, three bonus action per turn. It gets very strong. Yeah, it does. It starts piling up, especially when you look at it, you go, oh, I have to pick the three coin face. And then you realize the three, when you look at it, you go, oh, I have to pick the three coin face. And then you realize the three coin face is giving you a first star on your first turn. And you're like, oh, great. Actually, that means I can color in something else. Um, I like the boat mechanics as well, where you gradually, as you improve your track of a given thing, like say lobster and thing like say lobster, you'll get more, uh, you'll first get a license, which gives you a static bonus, but then you'll start getting boats. And then on fishing phases, which happen each even round, the boats will start filling up. And if you fill them completely, there's benefits for doing that. And that's just like one of the two pads. The other one has pads. The other one has King Crab on it, which is like a, it's not so easy to, to get going on King Crab. Um, yeah, it requires like four or five actions to get your first license. Yeah, and your license is pretty much like pure victory points. So it doesn't give you cool bonus abilities. Um, so that's, so it doesn't give you cool bonus abilities. Um, so that's, that's interesting. But also the harbor area has uh, the captain's club, which can give you bonus fishing rounds, which is great for, oh, I need to finish this boat. Boom. Um, or research vessels, which are just victory points and stuff. Especially if you have the uh, swordfish that gives you extra action, gives you extra action whenever you do a fishing phase. Uh, so yeah. getting for the, the captain's boat that gives you extra fishing uh, space also gives you extra action, and you can get a uh, you can get some very fun combo. Yeah, it's it's interesting how the dice are split in that you first roll your fishing dice, which is one more than the number of players, or the build the the town phase, so to speak. And uh, you might, as I said, start building stuff in the harbor, or you may just go uh, off into the wharf, um, which is where you can like build buildings for extra victory points of various types. <clears throat> or the market where you just go, how much fish have I got? It came with the expansion. It's called Dicey Waters. It gives you a second pad. And um, basically, whenever you... I need to remember this exactly. It's whenever you take the coin... Um, thing you're allowed to then check a box in the in the fishing I think it's you, you, in the, yeah in the fishing village and they give you a bunch of extra abilities there so it's got this whole other area where you're kind of pushing on it um, and, and juggling back and forth between the two so I really like fleet it I like how easy it I like how easy it is to operate and and how it gives you a bunch of different strategies and things to do and I really I'm really excited that the app's coming out soon yes I, I really like a tiny board game that you can just pick up uh, get playing explain the rules in in 10 minutes uh, nice one the biggest problem right now regarding uh, fleet is that it's very hard to find um, I, it is. Yeah, I, I've been looking at my um, uh, gaming shop, local gaming shop, trying to, to find when they will restock, but no idea. The yeah. thing is that the app's coming out, and yes. that should be out sometime this year, and I think this is an ideal app game. It'll be like Cartographers, which I was perfectly happy to spend like four euros on. But I like rolling physical die. <laughs> I like it as well. Um but I, I think the other reason you're having trouble getting it is this is number 20 in the Eagle Griffin's trouble getting it is this is number 20 in the Eagle Griffin's bookcase series and people just collect that series. I got one to 10 and then I haven't got anything until 20 and now I'm like, oh no, why did this have to be number 20? Um, and believe you me, like numbers one to 10, they include some amazing stuff like roll through the age of like roll through the ages um, and for sale. And they can include some absolute stinkers. So you, if, if you collect them, you have to buy some bad games. So just get Fleet. Just get it on the app or something. So you don't have to worry about that box sitting there with a 20 on the end of it and going, I could have more. As far as I know, right? No, I, I did watch um, a video about the solo rules and a playthrough. And um, 
yeah i mean i don't have m that much experience with roll it, and writes it is very straightforward <laughs> yeah de definitely roll and write roll and write yeah <laughs> it, it, it reminds me a little bit of the pinball game as well which is also very roll and write or um uh, that's pretty clever has that a lot of this as well that's actually maybe the the one uh down point that i want to point out regarding fleet is that i i think that it could just have done i think that it could just have done with a, an indented uh cardboard uh character sheet well uh like a write down sheet uh i don't like games with pads because i always feel bad about writing on them i know i can always print them but it, it's not very ecological it could just be uh cubes onto print them but it, it's not very ecological it could just be uh cubes onto uh onto a sheet yeah i don't need to write anything it's just like filling up boxes the trouble is pads are cheap uh, to produce oh yeah um uh, and yeah i agree i'd like a double in i was when i was playing fleet the actual thought went through my head was i wish i my head was i wish i had a double layered yeah. uh, cardboard board and i was just like putting cubes in to track what i was doing or I had what they have with uh, Railroad Inc, which is a reusable whiteboard marker pad. And all I ever need to worry about is, oh, eventually I'll have to replace the pens. Yeah, it's so. definitely the kind of game that where you could just... But I mean, honestly, with, with all these games that use pads in some way, I've never used them up completely. <laughs> so... That that is true, but it's always that feeling of uh <laughs> Yes, I know, I know. And like I, if there's a I, scoring pad, I hesitate to write on it because yeah, I think because yeah. I think what if it runs out, even though See, there are like you're, 50 you're pages. okay. <laughs> you'll be you'll be fine. Here's my tip, all right? You use the pad and when you get down to the last ten or so, you buy yourself a laminator and you laminate the last like set of pads equal to the number of players, and then you've got rewritable ones. You're fine. It's what I've done. And then you've got rewritable ones. You're fine. It's what I've done. I had to do with um, Tales of uh, Trails of Tucana, which I really love, um, I, and Cartographers. Uh, I had to get myself some just handmade, laminated, rewritable things. So plastic, that's the answer. Hooray. Hooray. Uh, some places I think they let you buy a new pad, but nobody, you're right. Nobody wants an empty box sitting on their shelf that they like. Anyway, <clears throat> next up, uh, we've got to shut down the hollow deck and take a sift through the chaotic star system of Zaya Legends of a Drift System, Legends of a Drift System, which is one of my favourite solo games, um, and it's when I've always had an enjoyable time playing with other people, even though I do terribly every time I do. So Zaya is. <sighs> I want to say a sandbox game, but like that's not really a board. But like that's not really a board game genre. Um, but that's literally what they pitch it as. Uh, so I guess it's along with Sleeping Gods, one of the only sandbox games I've played. But it's nothing like Sleeping Gods. Uh, so it's it's a very ostentatious, very American production filled with American production filled with dice chucking and randomness and all sorts of nonsense. You're a, you start off with a tiny like rubbish little ship that's got uh, a few spaces on it, enough to fit maybe a big engine and uh, some shields and maybe a tiny gun if you want a gun and some cargo, and then you just go off and become the most famous pilot by doing things, and you can get. Um, fame points, which is the scoring mechanism through uh, attacking other ships or through upgrading your ship or being really good at trading, exploring, being brave enough to jump through a warp gate, being nicely made um, hex, 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 hexes? They're hex hexes, aren't they? They're like, I don't know how many hexes are on them, but they're, they're hexes made up of hexagons. <laughs> um and you'll have like hextiles. one in the middle. Yes, hextiles. You have one in the middle, um, and you'll have um, one for each player that's in the game and lay it out. And everyone will start exploring around and just trading. I've played games where someone's just gone full cutthroat and started like blowing anyone up who tries to do anything. It's like you got cargo, have you? Gimme. Um, and it's it's just great for the emergent storytelling. Um, and also, as I saw when we played, it's apparently really good as well. If you, it's apparently really good as well if you if you fancy calculating the odds to do an incredible maneuver of like 
jetting across the galaxy in a single turn and going, salvage here, harvest here, <laughs> and then mine here. Well, I, I, I've never seen anyone achieve that before. And it was like, it took you a couple of tries to get it right, Kara, but yep. it was really cool. <laughs> get it right, Kara, but yep. it was really cool. <laughs> and that secured you the victory. Yeah, yeah, it did. Um, that's that's what I think's neat as well, is the game goes, decide how many faint points you want to play to, to adjust the length. We played to 10, it was a learning game, it took around three hours. Um, a full game, they say hours. Um, a full game, they say 20, 20 faint points. Uh, yeah, but once you know what you're doing, you get faint points a lot quicker. The first few games of Zaya are always you prodding the engine of the game engine, not your ship engine. Maybe Maybe Alexis, you should have prodded your ship engine because you should have prodded your ship engine because it seemed garbage. Yeah, my ship engine uh, really uh, <laughs> crippled me at the start. I was. <laughs> didn't you get? Didn't you move like one space followed by one space followed by two or something? <laughs> it, was something yes. it was something stupid like that. It was like, I guess your ship takes a while to warm up. Meanwhile, yeah. I built one with a giant and nothing but run out of energy, <laughs> drift aimlessly in space because I miscalculated. Um, uh, so yeah, how, how did you guys find it? It is, I gotta say, it's it's a game that I don't think is the best game I've ever played, but it's a game that always has a few really enjoyable moments that I look back. What I don't mind doing really badly at. I do like. I do think that the the game works best as a as a storytelling device, and I think that we didn't engage with it uh, that way as much, but I think that the little stories, the little events that happens, uh, for example, when I tried to, uh, uh, for example, when I tried to uh, smuggle so, uh, some cargo going through the uh, the, def the planetary defense of, um, of a lawful planet, and then immediately ran into an asteroid uh, after getting my first bounty. Um, or 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 the story of Kara's uh massive or or the story of Kara's uh massive uh slingshot maneuver to get into the the different uh mining and harvesting spot all over the map because we had a map generation that did not work for that objective but Kara made it work. I think that those aspects of the game are really fun. Maybe it was also because it was a, a learning game, so the the three hours to to play those uh, those stem theme points felt a bit long. But towards the end of the game, once I started grasping how the game worked and realized how I could make money and how I could get points, I was enjoying myself a lot better. I think that there's a lot of juggling between everything that you can do, uh, and like learning that is probably what uh, what really uh, slowed the game down at the start. But once once it's it's known, uh, turns can get a lot quicker and a lot more uh, interesting and a lot more fast. Uh, I think that uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I think I think you're right. Um, in my experience, the game does gain velocity when you've got experience with it, and also as you get further into a game, it's also you can just stall out and not get anywhere because if you're trying to make money or as as my wonderful ex, uh, experience was i my wonderful ex, uh, experience was i put p picked up a card that said go to go to asteroid field tk421 mm -hmm. and um, it never popped and it never popped i found it like right near the end of the game after i'd gone and gotten hit by an ice asteroid and my ship had turned into a giant popsicle and i crashed into another asteroid the insurance <laughs> um it uh, it finally turned up, but that was too late. I'd lost the mission at that point. Um, so, I, I my problem was I wasn't being focused when I was playing because I was sort of like teaching the rules and trying to answer questions. And, yeah, I mean it, it's yeah. not about. I, I think that the game works best when it's telling stories rather than mm -hmm. I need to. Oh my god, um, I mean I I do like clear structured designs and you know just having information easily readable and available and you know not too many colors and so um and came and thought oh my god someone just broke open the cabinet with uh, design pieces and spewed everything over the table um <laughs> that's that's brilliant that's such a good description of the game on the table <laughs> it's, it's very information overload the game yes that's that way as well i mean 
before you even start playing, you have to make the decision, hey, what modules do you want on your ship? And it's like, I have no idea how this game is played. What do you want from me? And um, so, yeah, the, the, the start was very brown. Um, I think um, I drowned when I tried to pilot three asteroid fields in a row and then you swam when you just did it. Yeah. You'd have to worry yeah. about asteroids for the rest of the game. And I was like, yeah, that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. Really cool. um, I, I, I mean, that's the, the same with my amazing maneuver I did. Um, I The first role I did killed me. So um, <laughs> it's a game where I feel like you have to accept that you can't plan. Um, you can set yourself some objective and try to reach it. And you have your amazing engine, like the best one in the game, and you roll the die and you move one space. Um, this can happen. So as soon as I kind of accepted that for myself, it became a lot more fun. Um, basically also what, what you said, Fan, like not try fun. Um, basically also what, what you said, Fan, like not trying to win really. It's, it's more like, yeah, traveling the stars and, and having fun and going on adventures. Um, <clears throat> Regarding game length, um, I can imagine. It. <clears throat> Regarding game length, um, I can imagine it's it's getting faster with more experience. I mean, we've seen it in our game. Uh, like until uh, someone reached three fame points, it took quite a while, but later on it became faster. And um, still, yeah. I is a problem because yeah. player turns can take quite a long time. Um, so. There That's are one of the things my partner loves about the game, is is they can just chill out and like chat when it's not not their turn, and it's, so it, it's quite a nice group activity, like what they call the beer and pretzels situation. You know, you're not because the game's not serious enough to really sit there and plan your turn. And when it comes around, you're just like, okay, well, I was going to try and do this. Oh, I've blown up. Your turn. Yeah, th that's the thing. Where sometimes you. You tr you have your plan for a turn and then you roll uh, move one. You you tr you have your plan for a turn and then you roll uh, move one twice and then you blow up <laughs> and then you just have to accept the consequence of that. Uh, that that can be a problem. I think that the um, the biggest problem with that is probably that you we, we have so problem with that is probably that you we, we have so many action so many different actions that you can do and so many different goals that you can set yourself sometimes it can be a bit uh, a bit much and I, at least on the um uh the virtual version it was kind of hard to follow other people's turn you need to find their uh ship within the the very colorful uh mess that the table was <laughs> But I think that was the virtual tables. Um, it, it it definitely issue. is. Um, the virtual um, table is very very busy. And very it gives loud. You, like it is loud. Yes. Um, Visually. And it, and it gives you like everything. The the boards are literally what other people's ships are. Because I can imagine that having a uh, three dimension is is probably makes makes our uh, things a lot easier. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I think that the only aspect that I liked a little bit less with the game was the. Um, uh, the randomness of some roles. Uh, thankfully, there is there are the randomness of some roles. Uh, thankfully, there is there are some ways to mitigate that um, through the the different uh, modules that you can add to your ship. But I I found about that a little bit late into the game. Mm. Yeah, but sometimes having like a very like one of the last role of the game was me. Sometimes having like a very like. One of the last role of the game was me using uh, my uh, max level missiles or hoping to blow up the um, uh, lawful enforcer of the galaxy. And I rolled a pitiful uh, 6 out of 20, I think. Uh, yeah, I rolled a 6. And so they they just completely um, nullified my attack and I couldn't, yeah. couldn't get the, uh, them down. Well, you say that, but in contrast, your previous missile uh, two turns earlier obliterated mm. it in a single shot, which also yeah, exactly. usually shouldn't happen. So yeah, but, but both happens. of those uh, 
more controlled uh, yep. spread of that. Well, um, that's where, again, the game gives you a little bit because yeah. you could buy a shield piercer and mount it. And if you work like I don't... Missiles only fire one missile a turn because they they got really long range. But you could have a shield piercing blaster and get two shots, ignoring four points of shields. Um, it's ignoring four points of shields. Um, so yeah, there that's, is... That's a it's lot the expansion better. that added a lot of that stuff in. Uh, the main game just didn't have it. Uh, and yeah. It was, yeah, you could be but, frustrating. But but it, I I think that what well, that's the design of the game that there's mm-hmm. so much randomness and that uh, a lot of your turn can be you mm-hmm. s- so much randomness and that uh, a lot of your turn can be you cannot plan your turn as as Kara yeah. said I think that was uh, very much part of the game. Um, there was also the mission aspect with which I don't feel I fully grasped, um, mm-hmm. but it felt a bit hard to around them. Uh, rather, uh, but maybe uh, maybe that was also because my ship was not exactly uh, meant to travel around the galaxy fast. No, your ship was very slow. Yes, it, it was. Uh, it was very slow. That, and sneaky. that was a big problem at the the start. I think that I, if I played it at a game, I would go for uh, faster, bigger engines. The medium ones actually like pretty good, and you can also buy the module that increases your dice roll by two. Um, you can't go above maximum. But then if you're on a D8 and you're rolling between a 3 and an 8 and like several results just create an 8, that helps uh, as well. I think that after victory point with you being at 3, I think, yeah. and then in the last hours, uh, in the last 40 minutes, we, we got, uh, Kara got 5 point, I got 3, and you got I got 1. one. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, it's it's It accelerates a lot towards the end, it, it, but also as does. soon as we, we learned how the game functioned. I think. Yeah. Uh, but it, also it as does. soon as we, we learned how the game functioned, I think. Yeah. Uh, I think I, th- I think as well. I'd like to just talk about my very favourite aspect, which is the ship design. Mm. Um, I really yes. like I like uh, polyominoes. Um, I I like fitting them in, and I, I enjoy the way each ship has nominoes. Um, I I like fitting them in, and I enjoy the way each ship has its own layout that you're trying to fit these awkward shapes into, and then leave space for uh, like cargo and everything. Um, it's kind kind of interesting, and also the way the, each of the modules has like a set number of ways you can arm. Interesting, and also the way the, each of the modules has like a set number of ways you can arm it. So like an engine might have three slots, so you can activate it three times in a turn if you're willing to spend the energy. Or, whereas a missile or blasters is less. I think that's really neat how you can customize it. Mm. And the ship power I enjoy as well because you know you have a choice of two powers to pick for your ship and they can change a bit how it focuses. Uh, I thought like once you upgraded to a tier two ship, I was like, damn, that ship's impressive. Yeah, the the, the ship powers are, are very fun and and they're usually either passive or like. Um... They cost energy, but but give you a, a very strong. I can definitely see uh, that those powers completely influence the strategy that you're going for. Yeah, mine was uh, um, whenever I drew a sector, I was allowed to orientate it in whatever direction I wanted, as opposed to having to have it in the fixed direction, which was great for blind jumping. Um, and also, then if I'd have gotten all the sectors onto the board, uh, the four, so I'd have always had at least four movement a turn. Um, but I couldn't get the last sectors out. That's why I was like, big engine, tiny shield, off we go, explore, explore. Oh, wait, this is not working. Yeah, I think in the end, it's, it's really, you have to like randomness. Um, and for example, um, <laughs> that's, and for example, um, <laughs> that's something like you could say, yeah, I'm going for trading. Yeah, I, I want to just fly around and trade. And, um, then you get a mission and in the mission you're supposed to kill someone and it's like okay you're supposed to kill someone and it's like okay <laughs> that doesn't really fit my style and yes you draw three mission cards and pick one but you can draw three missions where you have to fight something um yeah you, you can but you also always have the option to just abandon a mission and go draw some like when you die you roll where you respawn. Mm-hmm. And so it could happen that you respawn and you find yourself in a kind of closed off area of the galaxy where nothing to trade is suddenly. And um, so 
you're tr <laughs> you have to think of something else we so um, we started the game with only one station onto the the map that can regenerate all energy and a, a like I think that all of us except you, Kara, because you you are the ship that didn't have that problem, uh, were very much in in risk of drifting. Yeah. Um, I I wanted to also quickly note one of my favorite mechanics in this game is the exploring mechanic, where you get to the edge of an existing tile, and you can either stop and spend energy to scan the tile that's next to you. You draw it, you look at it, you put it down, and you get the information. Or you could do a space that's blank and just draw the tile and play it and orientate it. And so just a, pretty much a rite of passage for almost everyone is eventually pushing it too much and blind jumping into something that just destroys them, which is uh, Im immensely enjoyable if, you, if you're if you cool with that. If you're cool with your plans getting blown up in a horrible uh, hellfire, if, you, if you're cool with that, if you're cool with your plans getting blown up in a horrible uh, hellfire and then you have to respawn somewhere else on the map, that's okay. But uh, it's also, once your ship gets bigger, you've got to start, or you've got a lot of cargo or something, you shouldn't be doing that. You should not be blind jumping, should you, Alexis? No, no. That is, uh, that can be a very... Doing that. You should not be blind jumping, should you, Alexis? No, no. That is, uh, that can be a very, very dangerous uh, that, initiative. That, that was the move that cost you, like, the game, I think, was where you yeah. blind jumped while you had a load of valuable cargo and you just went straight into something that blew you up. Uh, I was like, it, it was a comet. <laughs> Yeah, okay, that's right. It just it just yeah. steamrolled you. I I, I, I just I started like, my criminal career, got yeah. a bounty, and then ran into a comet as fast as I could. Yeah, I was like, if you, if, if you, should, I was thinking you really got to, you should expand, you should you should scan, but I was like not. Uh, it was like a brief thought right after you declared the blind jump and moved and drawed, and I was like, oh no. And as you can hear, it kicks off a lot of stories. I didn't have a chance to talk about the solo mode. Um, I would just briefly say I really like it because it um, gives you a goal and has a campaign and everything. Um, it's very enjoyable, but that's in the expansion. So this is not a cheap game to get. And the expansion is not cheap. And typically some of the crowdfunding. Let's let's use Kickstarter a bit less, people, please. Um, give it a look if you're thinking, I'm cool with this kind of randomness and I want a elite slash frontier, uh, no man's sky kind of experience on a board game. And I don't mind randomness and a bit of downtime to chat with people. It's time now to charge up your photon torpedoes and engage the warp drive for pitched battle. Shields up. Commander Kara, you have the helm. Yes. Let's talk about Star Wars The X-Wing miniatures game. And I'm really sorry. I'm, I might just with this question. Really sorry. I'm, I might just with this question lose my street cred. Not street cred completely, but do they have warp drives in Star Wars? No, they don't. That was exactly the joke. Was none of that stuff was in Star Wars. It's all. All right. <laughs> all right. Great. Good thing. <laughs> I didn't lose my nerd cred. So mm -hmm. right. great. Good thing. <laughs> I didn't lose my nerd cred. So. Mm -hmm. um, Anyway, um, Star Wars X-Wing miniatures game um, was first released in 2012 and got a second edition in 2018 and, and um, is probably like one of the most known miniatures game outside of like Warhammer um, stuff. So. Um, First of all, one big reason why I started getting into it, it has pre-painted miniature painter. So um, that's a big plus for me because like having armies of gray soldiers on a table isn't as much fun as if they're painted. And um, <clears throat> yeah, so it's basically a skirmish game. You um, build your um, squadron of two and maybe eight ships. Um, you can outfit them with different upgrades depending on which ship it is um, and then you find it out. Um, the normal uh, game mode is like I think 70 minutes timer and after this how many points everyone has left and the one with the most points left has won. Um, <clears throat> but you can also just you know play until one side is completely annihilated or whatever. It's very it's very um, variable in how you want to play it. It's officially a two-player game, 
but of course there is nothing stopping you from stopping you from having three people or four people or more um, putting their squadrons on the table and duking it out. So um, yeah, um, the rules I just found out that it's uh, the the rules just found out that it's uh, the the rule system has a name and i and i forgot the name again um let me just yes the flight path game system so um when you so um when you activate a ship you have to decide beforehand the maneuver it has to take so um, everyone decides on the maneuvers for this round with uh, hidden dials. Then you, um, in initiative order, flip the dials um, and do the maneuvers um, for those. So you um, slot them into uh, on uh, between two packs on the bases of the ships and uh, then move your ship according to the template. And um, after that, um, again, in initiative order, um, the ships can fire which is done by using dice. There are red dice for attacking, green dice for defending. And um, yeah, if you roll an evade on a green die, you can cancel one hit on a red die. And that's very basically explained what... Uh, very basically explained what uh, the rules are. Um, of course, with more upgrades come more special cases and abilities and things you can do, ways you can mitigate dice rolls, etc. So um, I have to admit at this point, I'm so um, I have to admit at this point, I'm not very. Neither am I good, not am I very knowledgeable about the game because I'm I've only recently got into it and didn't have much games yet. Um, I do did find um, a um, but so my first impressions. Um, you likely would start with the core box and it has like one X X wing and two Tie fighters and. Um, there are three ways you can play with this. The first one is works, and um, that's what I did with a friend. And it was kind of frustrating because the randomness was really high in it, and um, it took a long time until someone finally managed to actually do damage. It took a long time until someone finally managed to actually do damage and, and so on. So um, it was good to, as I said, learn the rules, but it wasn't as much fun. The second way is something that I think is really great. It's something that I think is really great for beginners, um, quick build cards. I'm at the point that I'm trying to figure out how to build my squadron for the next, uh, like next first day. Um, I'm visiting this uh, X-Wing community again to build squadrons for it. And it's it's so much work and I have no idea what I'm doing. And um, quick build cards are basically like predefined templates um, with a challenge rating. Um, so you might have an X-Wing and Luke Sky has a challenge rating of three and you look at a quick, quick build card and see, okay, he comes with this, this and this upgrade. So you just take out the cards, put it on the table and know this is a challenge rating of three. And in a regular game, you would pick ships with a combined rating of eight. Um, of course, with a core set to eight, but you would have the X-Wing with four challenge rating and then the other player can pick the two TIE fighters with a setup that has combined challenge rating of four as well. And then you have a more or less fair game with upgrades and um, and suddenly it becomes really fun. Um, if you have more things to do, if you have multiple ships, they can interact in some way, they can give each other tokens or whatever. Um, and then of course you can start using the uh, fleet builder apps and try to wade through the depths of 
special cases and depths of special cases and synergies and and whatnot and try to not lose your mind while building a 200 point squadron and then post it in a community and immediately get told that it's completely rubbish in a community and immediately get told that it's completely rubbish that's <laughs> what you did but um yeah so that's uh x-wing <laughs> I played it a few times. Um, I really like how it's engaged the player with uh, rules for dogfighting. I think that that aspect is really fun when you 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 do the the dogfighting uh, with uh, X wings against uh, Tie Fighter. Um, I'm going to get half of those names ro- uh, wrong, but that's fine. Um, I I'm not a, a Star Wars guy. What are you then? What are you? Uh... Uh, are you uh, a, a Star Trek guy? I think that uh, Farscape. Better. Uh, oh, uh, uh, Stargate. Uh, I said Farscape, that... but Stargate, sure. <laughs> to show that nobody remembers. Uh, no, I, I prefer Star Trek. Anyway, everyone uh, remembers Farscape. I, I, I'm a Red Dwarf uh, person. Oh, okay. And, and uh, Lex. All I right, like but... Lex a lot. Uh, my dad loves Lex. Um, it's very it's, strange. It, 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 it is. I like the theme song to Lex. That's about as much as I know. I remember being very little and hearing that. Obviously, I was not allowed to watch Lex and exactly yeah. um, suited for children. It's um, not suited for most people, I would say. <laughs> uh, but I was going to say quickly before we get back on topic, uh, yeah. what was your favorite Red Dwarf season? Ooh, uh, I f- I think that I remember, I don't remember if it's season 3 or 4, but the one with Rimmerworld in it, really good. Well, that's a good, Rimmerworld's a, a good call. I think that's season yeah. 6. Oh. Is it season 6? Yeah, it's season 6. It's my favourite season, season 6, because it has Gunmen in the Apocalypse in it, um, which is my favourite Red Dwarf episode. So, yeah. It is episode 5 of season 6. Oh, okay. So, yeah. It is episode 5 of season 6. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I I thought for a moment you were going to say the the episode with Mr. Flibble, which would have also be a fantastic episode uh, season. That's three. <laughs> it Quarantine. Is a good, it is a good one. Yeah, my uh, dad my dad again got me hooked on Red Dwarf. Dad again got me hooked on Red Dwarf. So, uh, uh, he's also uh, a Star Trek guy. Anyway, uh, that's that's off topic. Yeah, X Wing. Uh, X Wing. If I don't sound like I know much, it's because I played X Wing exactly twice, and I spent the whole time being excited about BB-8. <laughs> <laughs> I, I fun game. It's made by um ah, I don't remember their name uh, right now, but they also made uh, Netrunner, which is uh I knew them from that community. Uh, from that community. Do you, do you uh, mean Fantasy Flight Games? Fantasy Flight Games. That's the one. I, I don't remember the giant conglomerate. Now they've been consumed by another giant conglomerate, Asmodee, yes. which has been consumed. <laughs> yeah, but I one think they that... Asmodee kind of sold it to yeah. Atomic Mass Games. That's it has possible. it has changed um, hands now. I, I know there's a second edition, um, and there's I, I... some confusion about stuff. I remember that they posted a, that at some point. I don't remember if it if it was plans to have that or if it was games. Their X wing and their played a Star Wars character into a battlefield uh, to to merge the two games so that after managing to win a fight in X wing, you could move on to the battlefield with the their, their other game. Uh, I'm looking right now for the, the name of that game. It's Star Wars uh, Battle for the Galaxy. Also. In any case, I liked X-Wing a lot. The only uh, point that makes it a little bit hard is that it, it has a very expensive cost to get into it, right? I think that the base game is like 100... No, uh, no, 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 no. The base game is they like 40 it. or 50 euros. Oh, that's good. Um, and in fact, it's it would say speaks for it in regards to entry cost if you compare it to yeah. other um, miniature games. Um, of course you can spend a ton of money on it yeah yes um like it depends on how much you play it on on what your goals are um I mean you could say yeah sure i just buy a couple of ships so i you know with my quick build cards i can get to challenge rating of eight uh, simple enough and then i'm happy and maybe i have two factions so someone can come over and we can play 
and then you are you oh, likely will work. someone can come over and we can play and then you are you oh, likely won't pay more than 100 euros um but um, of course if you want to focus on a faction and want to get everything from this faction there are seven factions i believe in the game um from this faction there are seven factions i believe in the game um like the main factions from each trilogy and uh, then the scum and villainy faction which is basically all the bounty hunters and such and um ooh, 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 ooh. do they have the robot they they will get the robot. I I think it is it's one of the newest releases that's about to come. Cool, cool. Um, that's my second favorite robot in the series. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> and of course, if, if you want to have everything from, and then it depends on how flexible you want to be with your squadron builds, of course. Uh, like I've decided on the uh, Galactic Republic as a faction and um, I have quite a few ships now but I've seen builds online where they use Delta 7 Ether Sprites it's the Jedi uh, fighters from the Clone Wars and um, I have two so I, if I wanted to do such a build I had to buy two additional of these ships which would be another 40 euros um you, you can spend a lot you don't have to like if you if you're fine with having a small dogfight you could just buy two core sets then you have two x-wings four tie fighters and you could have, have a lot of fun with it um, yeah just with a, a friend or two yeah just a lot of fun with it um, yeah just with a, a friend or two yeah. just have a enjoy yourself with. aren't those people you know. aren't those people in our uh, gaming circle like the, in the sphere are the people who go i'll buy this one thing and that's all i want aren't they like unicorns are they just <laughs> super rare is it is it thing and that's all i want aren't they like unicorns are they just <laughs> super rare is it is it I'm, I'm looking at this and i'm like i can't go near this I'm, obviously as we know previously i'm not a huge fan of star wars anyway um although I love HK-47, um, it, it's it's the kind of thing I look at and I go, oh dear, this is, a, this is a rabbit hole. This is like, this is suddenly a where is my shelf space now I'm running out of it situation. Just looking at this stuff. So I, I, I couldn't help myself. I'll uh, I'll stick with Wings of War, I think. That's <laughs> I can't, you can't buy that anymore, so there's no. It's, yeah, I mean, it's I mean what just was posted in the channel here, the Epic Games, because there is like an, an upgrade you can do. The, I, I've only talked about the regular um, dogfight, and there are Epic battles you can do where you can field big ships, um, you know, like the CR ninety corvettes or. Um, the, um, I think the Imperial ship is like a TIE fighter carrier that I can like have, like two TIE fighters can dock to it, and um, it has special rules. There you don't use like individual fighters, but that's the next thing. Okay, I buy my Corvette for like ninety euros, and then of course I want to have a squadron with it. So the squadron consists of multiple of the same ship. So. I want to have like four of four X-wings now in a squadron, so I have to buy four X-wings. And so, yeah, you can sink a lot of money into that. Um, I'm very happy that the second edition hasn't really a uh, Republic epic ship yet. <laughs> yeah, I feel pretty sure that um, a friend of mine, one of the guys in my role-playing group, Nick, has a ton of this stuff. Because he's where I played the game before moving to Sweden. Um, uh, and Fred Jim, who loves big ship battles, I think he has a Marder, which is like. I have scale. that as well. We can talk about it in it's... another episode. <laughs> sure, if you want to, if you want, if you want, want to return to Star Wars some more, um, knock yourself out. I'm not going to stop you. Star Wars fans are very welcome. I'm just going to go back to talking about liking the draw. Well, the, the gameplay aspect of it is really fun. So that's uh. I remember the maneuvering yeah. to be very enjoyable in the same way that I liked the maneuvering for um, uh, Wings of War. That kind yeah. of dogfighting 
you got to turn in certain ways and follow the rules as to how the ship is able to maneuver is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. somewhat of a hurdle. I mean, I, I've talked about how difficult it is for me to like build squadrons. Um, I did notice, yes, uh, experience has a, has a big impact. Like um, my few fights I did at, with this community, fights I did at, with this community were very one-sided and um, I was like happy that I did a little bit of damage and um, because um, yeah they the people who've played it a lot are I, I, like they know what my sh the people who've played it a lot are I, I, like they know what my ships can do and not only that they also know to use this information like I could look up their maneuver dials and see okay and your ship can do these maneuvers and i can't do anything with that information these maneuvers and i can't do anything with that information at uh, my skill level so um yeah um so so if you want to start with this game i think it really helps to have like someone else start with you um like somewhat on the same level um or, you know, just find a community that's fine with, uh, I don't know, just trying out weird builds against you. So chances are they don't have like the most optimal synergies or whatnot, or uh, even be okay with using quick build cards. So you, um, you don't have to wait through this whole quadrant building thing. Sounds a bit like my experiences in playing uh, CEDH, Competitive Commander, where it's like, oh, this is a really refined and uh, you can't just rock up with any old commander deck. You, you, you're going to ruin the experience for yourself and everyone else. I mean, that's another thing. I, I'm, I'm in this game for like half a year now. And... Um, so I can't comment on it, but of course, new ships from time to time. And um, as with, I think, many miniatures games, there is always this complaint that new ships get released, new ships are the strongest. So if you want to stay competitive, you have to get the new stuff all the time. Um, Hello, power creep, my old friend. Stay competitive, you have to get the new stuff all the time. Um, Hello, power creep, my old friend. <laughs> I don't know if it's the same with X-Wing 2nd Edition because there is one thing that's also very different from other games. One thing that's also very different from other games, the point costs aren't printed on the cards. So um, you can just sit down with your cards and build your squadron. You have to use an app. Um, where the point costs are saved, and they so um, that's good. That allows them to to update it and patch it if need be. Yeah. So basically, if in fact it turns out a new ship is too strong, either they will they can um, raise uh, the costs for it, or they can lower costs for other things. So I don't know in how far they are actually doing it, but the option is there at least it seems like it has a very active community and very uh they're very enthusiastic about it as well yes That's and it has a solo mode <laughs> yes i haven't tried those yet mainly because i haven't gotten around to printing out the rules <laughs> but um yeah okay all right well yeah, indeed. That's uh, that is. Hang on, this is always a mouthful. Star Wars X-wing, the miniatures game, and it's set. okay. That's fantastic. And on that note, it's time for us to beam down for some well-earned shore leave on the relaxing ocean world of Planet Four Five Four Six B. I've heard they have <laughs> beaches to die for. So please perform culturally significant farewells, Admiral. Uh, from Belgium. Au revoir. And Commander. This is First Officer Fenn of the EUSS Last Standy signing off. You can support us at www.patreon.com forward slash Last Standy and follow us on Twitter at The Last Standy whenever our communications array is working. 
Until next time, remember that the second E in the ship's log stands for Enterprise. <laughs>